Thank you for joining us um, for this Zoom session, um, looking at the uh, women's report um, nearly five years on. Um, we're going to talk to our panellists who all were involved um, with the report in one way or another, um, and then I'm going to open up to questions. What I'd love you to do is, as we go along, if you have any questions, just pop them in the chat. I'm keeping an eye on that. Uh, and also, if there's any comments, um, ideally, if you could put them in the chat, that would be wonderful. Um, and we will not be holding back. We'll be talking about anything you like. Uh, but before we start, I'm going to make a statement, which we now make at the start of every uh, Writers Guild meeting and event. Every single one of us in this meeting and event is entitled to meet in a safe space a space free of fear, a space free of bullying and harassment of any kind. We'll work together, honouring our differences and celebrating the gifts we each bring to the table. We'll treat each other with politeness and respect at all times. And if we are subjected to or witness bullying and harassment, we will speak out knowing that our voices will be heard and we will be taken seri seriously. Together, we can create a safe space. So in that spirit, um, I welcome our panellists. And I'm going to ask you to introduce yourselves. Um, if you could tell us uh, what, how you got involved with the Guild and what position you held at the time we were uh, putting the report out, that would be brilliant. I'm going to go in the order that you are on my screen. So I'll start with Emma. Hi, I'm Emma Reeves. I um, have been a member of the Writers Guild for 20 years. I joined the TV committee um, and uh, because I was sort of concerned about various things and, and then for many years I was the I was the TV chair and I was the TV chair at the time of the original of the dis dis equality rights report. Thanks Emma. Samara? Hi everyone, I'm Samara Srivastav. I am currently co-chair of the Equality and Diversity Committee, newly created. Well I say newly but it's kind of like been quite a few years, it's not really new anymore, but at the time of um of the report i was a um guild member um and if anything this report um made me want to get more involved in the guild and uh when you do that the guild grabs you and doesn't let go <laughs> this is very true um, and olivia last but not least uh hi i'm olivia hetreed at the time of this report i was the president of the guild um, before that, I was on the film committee as a member and then as chair, um, and it was a very much a subject dear to my heart. So uh, I'd spent probably the previous 20 years um, fielding questions about why there were so few women screenwriters and not knowing the answer. So I was really keen to see if there were any answers and anything we could do about it. Thank you. And Olivia, I'll come back to you with sort of the opening of the discussion. Um, at what point was it decided that we needed to do a formal survey into the position of women in television and film writing? Well, I think we seem to be in a position in which um, there was a lot of anecdotal uh, evidence and a lot of our members and uh, writers in general saying this is a problem, uh, women are underrepresented, um, women are going, getting put into schemes and not onto jobs, um, all sorts of, you know, lots of things that people were feeling. And then when we took this to the various uh, broadcasters and authorities, they would almost always say, oh, but don't worry, it's getting better because we have done this in the last two years and this is happening and we've commissioned this and so on. Um, so don't worry, it's, it's all going to be fine now. And we felt that if we didn't get some hard evidence, we would be stuck in this kind of anecdotal loop and pushback forever. Um, and so we had we had a sense of what the evidence might prove, but we needed to to get it there. And and it did indeed. Well, and won't jump the gun, but it turned out to be incredibly effective to have numbers to back up your anecdotes because it was no longer a place that they could hide and go. It's all getting better. Absolutely. I know, was there a big discussion about um, the best methodology to get the evidence? Because this is something that I think we, we struggle with continually. How do we prove our point and how do we get the evidence for how writers are being treated? Uh, yes, there was. And I think um, 
you know, I think it had been something that, you know, at the time when we first joined the TV committee, you know, years before I was chair, that we were all very aware of. And we talked about it a lot. And as Olivia said, um, we, we, we would go to um, commissioners and um, say that this is a problem and um, be completely fobbed off. I mean, you know, since the 90s, I was a bit bad at being told that, oh, these problems are all in the past and things are getting better. And I just felt things were just not getting better and people were just saying they were. So um, it started with... Um, the, some of the guild staff in the office at the time um, started doing surveys of the Radio Times and just noting down all the male and female names. And we kind of had a jaw dropping ratio, which we presented to the producers. And they were just like, oh, that doesn't count. That's just anecdotal. That's not, you know, they wouldn't, they wouldn't really hear it. And so we, so we realized we need to have a proper academic report, which needed, which needed an independent researcher and needed funding, quite a lot of funding. So, um, so basically we just wanted, um, some sort of tool which which we could use um, to make people acknowledge that the problem that we could clearly see was actually there. Um, just for, for anybody who doesn't know that we secured a, a large part of the funding from ALCS, which is the collecting uh, agency for the UK, and they've been great supporters um, of the Guild and, and any work like this, so big thanks um, to them. So yeah. the money was in place, the academics were in place. Um, Olivia, what was the expectation? And then were you surprised by what actually came out? Well, I think the, just sort of just before that, the, 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 the thing that made this possible was, was um, a fairly kind of crude measuring tool, which was being able to look at people's names. And that's one of the things that I think we'll go on to discuss in other contexts of other kinds of quality in inequality um, is that for the most part, you can tell somebody's gender by their name. So it was a, a simpler counting exercise, but it was still a, a huge amount of, of work to undertake. Um, and as I said, we, I think we, we felt the anecdotal evidence was you know, pretty convincing, um, but actually the numbers were worse than we expected. I think we were all a bit taken aback and we had all thought, oh, this is going to be quite bad. But the, the consistency across all the different areas that we were looking at from um, continuing drama to high-end TV to film um, it was just it was extraordinarily consistent and the numbers were always just slightly worse than we had expected rather than slightly better and they hadn't changed you know yeah. in complete contrast to that story that we were constantly told that things were getting better and it was just you know that was a kind of historic lag and so on actually for so long things have not shifted um, I think that was probably the single most shocking thing to me was the lack of progress over the years. And, and a couple of statistics that, that stuck out to me, because there, there was so much to take from, from the problem. There were the headlines of 16% um, on average, 16% uh, of working film writers were um, female and only 14% of primetime TV uh, being female. That, that was the shocking headline. But the other thing that, um, I found interesting was going into courses because it was a very wide ranging uh, survey going into higher education courses, training, those kind of things. The split was pretty much 50 50. And then the drop off sort of happens the minute people graduate, minute people come into the industry. And I thought that was extraordinary. And, and I, the other statistic, which I love to quote in meetings, was the film one which were films written by women in the UK were far more critically and financially successful than those written by their men, statistically speaking. And I said, that's still one I love to throw into the, to the mix every now and then. Samara, at this point, um, you're a member of the Guild, but you've, you've not become an activist. What did you feel when you started to see the stats coming out um, from the report? Um, it was, uh, so disheartening I guess uh that was the first um response from myself but also I couldn't help but wonder about the intersectionality of that so if you're also a woman 
and disabled or you're a woman and you're a person of color or you know you're a woman and you're from the lgbtq community what does that look like and um and what's that experience like and so yeah that's what sort of compelled me to come and have a chat and talk about whether we could set something up that looks specifically at those issues um hence the creation of the equality and diversity committee and i spy that my co-chair miranda walker is actually oh. listening on this call um so we're we we currently um look at the uh diversity agenda across all crafts for for the guild so it's quite a quite a big remit um and uh looking at all the pro pro protected characteristics and how we can look at what the issues and barriers are for those writers and it is very they're very different um depending on where they are in their sort of journey and what what sector they're working under um so it's a big job from there and uh we only have so many people and so much resource but I think what was became apparent was that we still need to be able to champion the um all these different communities of writers and one of I mean we've done a number of things for for um speaking to the writers in terms of what they felt were um, their concerns and how we could best help and support them in that. And I think Olivia, you were about to speak on one of the problems we've had before. We'd love to get more information like this, but the the methodology for intersectionality is quite difficult. You cannot tell whether someone is a, a member of the LGBTQ population or uh, has a disability or whether they're a person of colour from their name. And anybody who thinks they can is uh, kidding yeah. themselves. So yeah, uh, you're relying much more than on self-reporting. Um, and that always, you know, there's always a kind of um, inherent bias in that because the people who are engaged with the subject are more likely to respond to you and so on. So you have to be cautious with that kind of um, evidence. But and I know that it's it's been a frustrating process trying to get this underway. Um, but it's. And I, I think another person who's on this call is Jennifer Tuckett, who's doing the Women in Theatre survey at the moment. Um, so, I mean, I think those are they're very useful. It's incredibly useful to get people to report. And it's a way of, you know, finding out much more about people's experience. Um, but we do need to also try and find ways of de dealing with it. I noticed that Gina Davis is using AI. Um, the Gina Davis Institute is using AI to try and uh, do this reporting, which I'm fascinated to know how AI does that. But <laughs> <laughs> yes, one of the many uses for it at the moment. Um, John's just put uh, the survey monkey for the women in third right. uh, in the chat if anybody wants to take uh, part in that. Um, thinking about the emotional effect of the report coming out, um, Samara, obviously you turned it into activism. Emma, how, how did you feel when you, you read the report? I mean, as Olivia said, it was worse than expected. I mean, it's sort of awful to say justified, but, you know, I did feel that I'd been banging my head against a brick wall on this for years. And, uh, and of course, you know, the fact that we went with women first doesn't mean that we think gender is more important than class or race or disability or sexuality. But just that it was it was a very basic because it was just it turned out it is so unbelievably hard to get this information on any of these categories and it's such a, a basic thing to say but the, the name factor made it easiest e that was the easiest thing to do to start with but of course when we'd you know we'd kept on raising this with, with people and they just refused to, sit, to admit there was an issue so one thing they said was it's getting better and two and another thing they said was oh well we're not concerned about that anymore we're looking at other um, areas of inequality. But I mean, you know, to be frank, I think we all know on this call, all of those are much worse. So, you know, the fact that the, the women thing is so, it's it's far from solved then and it's far from solved now. And, um, we'll, you know, we'll get onto the current situation in a minute, but um, it was a bit of a moment of feeling incredibly justified because the, the stats more than 
bore out our most pessimistic predictions. Mm. Um, you know, that the headlines were bad. Um, and even, and there's a lot of things going into that sort of with, within that sort of, okay, women are writing this many episodes, but how many shows, um, a majority written by women, how many women are lead writers? And um, those things are really, and, and CBBC, which, which I work for a lot, uh, which very much everyone thinks, oh, that's that's all women. Um, but when they looked at who got to be lead writer on CBBC shows, 86% of those shows had a male lead writer. So sort of even in my backyard, as it were, I was able to sort of say to people, look, don't be complacent. You're not as good as you think. And I think I can speak to um, the initial reaction from the industry. Um, and I'm not going to name any names. <laughs> Um, but I'd, I'm not talking out of school. So when um, it, the industry became aware that we were even preparing um, this report, um, I started to get um, some panicky emails. Um, and I wasn't even chair at that point. I'm still deputy chair. Uh, panicky emails from um, people who had been commissioners in the past. And it was like they were already getting their excuses in. Um, one former commissioner didn't even write to me directly, got his wife to write to me um, and say that uh, he, <laughs> and I think she worded it like this, and I, I hope she regrets it now. Um, uh, this person has had lots of women in his office over the years. Um, another um, former commissioner was absolutely furious and felt victimised that we were even, this was before the results came out. Um, and it, I think I was a bit shocked at that because then when the results did come out, I'm going to be honest, I was incredibly naive. And I thought our industry, I, now I feel like an idiot saying this. I thought our industry was going to go, oh, good heavens, what a terrible problem. Shall we immediately solve it? And actually we got a lot of pushback. Um, at first. So, Olivia, did you um, get on the tail end of any of that? Um, yeah, I think what was interesting was that there were a few people who, a few commissioners, I think of Anne Menser in particular, um, but there were a few others who immediately went, ah, this is a, a challenge to take up yeah. um, and let's take action. And, and it was really salutary to see that, that it was quite possible for somebody in a position of power to respond to this in a really positive way. Because as you say, there was a lot of pushback and, well, when I was doing it, it was fine. And, um, you know, we tried to find women, but there weren't any and all of the usual excuses. Um, but there were some people who immediately did do as you had hoped they would, Lisa, and and kind of went, okay, let's let's do something about this. Let's try and make a change. Um, and I thought that was was more telling in a way than the the rather you know depressingly expected. Uh, oh, it really wasn't my fault, and I wasn't there. I was on holiday at the time, you know. Uh, Samara, I mean, looking at the wider implications do you think this sort of pride opens to us because obviously this happened at the start of lots of conversations about um access to our industry how we need to change etc having been at the head of the equality and diversity committee for a while how do, do you think things are getting better or do you think we're just at the start of a very long journey oh dear um I would say that it's it is a start of a very long journey for sure. Um, I think we're um, we're like a really big ship with a tiny rudder. What was that? Titanic or whatever? <laughs> <laughs> the whole thing crashed and sank in the mud. But um, this, I think, the thing that 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 I do think though that there are things that we can do to help the cause and to help to help literally individual writers better uh, combat the industry by, um, of course, at the end of the day, we want uh, commissions. We want people to be in work doing what they love and doing what they want to the best of their ability and being heard on an equal footing. 
whilst we still strive towards that goal, there are many smaller battles that we can that we can take up along the way that will help make that journey just that little bit more um, easier or, you know, or, or for them to feel just that little bit more supported. Um, things that I'm thinking of is the amazing group um, on the committee uh, of disabled writers who put together a rider to be able to um, communicate their needs just that simple act of being able to as a disabled writer to communicate your needs that actually I have these access problems actually I you know you need to communicate to me in this fashion in order for me to be able to do my best work that was non-existent before um, the E&D picked up that button and has already been showing benefits to that to that community of writers so it's not a massive sea change, but it is a step in the right direction. So whilst I do think that it's, it's a, it's a, it is a long road to hoe, um, I do think that there are smaller gains and wins that we can do along the way that will make things, um, that will make things better. And bullying and harassment across all the different, you know, all the different groups, whether that's, you know, in terms of race or sexuality, you never really know what, on what basis you are going through the, the you know the horriblest time um so I think those things also are important to be able to just simply talk to other writers and to get through it together um and those and, th and that's another big thing that came from um uh, from the committee is just having people having networks having groups of people that who have a similar who are coming at things from a similar background who can speak and talk openly and freely together and 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 learn and offload and share information about who the, who the good ones are and who the who you should probably best avoid it all it all helps um but commissions coming out left right and center for for women and writers of color to say well, we're still a long way to go yeah and I'd, I'd say um, one of the very positive things that, that came out of, uh, and I'm speaking very personally, my personal involvement is uh, I'm looking at the names on the call saying, and I know that I've been in a room with a lot of people uh, on this Zoom today. I think a, a, a collectivism came from it. There's a, a women's writers group on, on Facebook. I, I know that people got together. Emma, I, in looking at the positives, I'm, and I'm going to list some actual statistics in a, in a moment, looking at the positives, how did you feel once the dust had settled? Do you think it, it moved us forward, particularly the Guild? Um, well, I think it, I think it's a, certainly um, moved things forward. I, th I think it's sort of, you know, much, much as um, people try to deny it, I think it sort of, um, it, it, it did sort of shake things up a bit. And I think, you know, people began to realise that, that um, this is still an issue. Um, I think, um, you know, I would like to, I mean, I think there was, and I, and I felt that certain commissioners made a certain amount of noise about it. Mm. Um, I'm not, um, I'm not sure that the actual statistics have moved on as much as, as much as we would like. And I think there is, um, there's a lot to talk about in terms of, you know, I, I, I think sort of, I, th I think it's become a lot less acceptable for a writing team to not have some token women, but, yeah. A lot of but a lot but female names on the credits who have been substantially rewritten by the male showrunner is not actually getting female voices heard so i think that's still something we need to look at and i just wanted to say quickly about your thing about education like one thing that i always want to talk about with women in arts particularly in things like because that's my area and things like theater acting and writing it's a slightly different problem to stem subjects because with stem subjects um there's a lot of we need to get girl. We need to get teenagers studying. We, we need we need to get more young people at university. Whereas, as you say, we are actually talking about things which are widely considered at school girls subjects. Mm. And um, why on earth is it that uh, that English and drama are considered girls subjects at school? And yet, as soon as there's prestige and money to be made, it's men taking all the best jobs. You know, something is cl clearly there is some institutional bias there absolutely um in terms of industry response after uh, the report came out um 
myself um, and uh, Ellie, the, the brilliant uh, Jen Sec of the Guild, ended up, and Emma, you were there as well. We ended up in a very nice um, room in the hospital club uh, that Anne Mensa had booked uh, for us with, I believe, basically every commissioner from every channel um, all in one room at, at one time. Uh, that was, I think, possibly the most intimidating meeting I've ever been to. And I think both of us went, oh, there's a good chance we could absolutely ruin our careers in this if we're not careful in this meeting. Um, it's not happened to either of us. It's been fine. But in terms of how the industry responded, I'm just going to read a couple of stats, which I think are important. Uh, ITV set up their comedy 5050 um, initiative and held a series of networking uh, meetings between producers and women writers, which I think was important. It wasn't just another one of those talking shops where you didn't get to meet people. They also introduced people to agents as well at the time. Uh, they set up a database of women writers that the producers could access, which is still available. And in 2019, ITV said they would no longer commission any all-male writing comedy teams. Now, I seem to remember that the right-wing press reacted to that by saying, oh, but the likely lads wouldn't have been written. Well, it turns out the likely lads still exists, but we are getting some interesting comedy now. Uh, the BBC's 2122 Diversity Commissioning Code of Practice boasts that 50%, 56% of those on writers' room schemes are women. But as we said, identified, schemes, etc. are great, but it has to turn into commissions. But the BBC has set aside 100 million over three years to fund diverse um, content. Although they've not included women as a category, they are for, for focusing on race, ethnicity, disability and social class, although that has an intersection. BBC have set 50 2012 workforce targets um, in the 20, for, for 20, 2021 to 23 as part of their action plan. So it's 50% um, women. BFI have continued to move forward with their diversity standards and Creative Diversity Network have started to publish writer specific figures um, about our industry. One of the problems we had is that there was diversity monitoring um, in the industry, but it was very uh, nebulous, shall we say. Um, and we've campaigned hard to make sure that our section of the industry was represented in those statistics. Um, moving on, how do we feel um, the picture is now and what work is left to done. I'm, I'm going to come to all three of you on that. Olivia, what do you think our next step is and, and how are you feeling now about our industry? I think one of the things that came out of this and also of Me Too, which obviously overlapped in some ways with this, was a sense um, that women could talk to each other about their experiences and that uh, women who had some power and influence could use it to further the careers of women without that being seen as a, a negative characteristic on their part. Um, so I think that was really beneficial. And and we we really need to hold on to that as, as a path going forward. Um, that on all these, all the areas and the intersectional areas and so on, that actually talking to each other and promoting each other and uh, helping each other both inside the guild and more widely um, is a really powerful, positive thing to do. Um, and it's it it slightly, it certainly doesn't um, replace, but it at least gives one a thing that you can be doing all the time in your working life rather than simply going, I'm frustrated that you know the powers that be are not changing things. Uh, I think we can also change things, and that's a really has been for me a really useful lesson from the whole experience of doing it. Thank you, Olivia. Samara, how's taking the temperature of the industry at the moment? How are you you feeling? I don't know. I can't really sort of say that I feel like anecdotally there's necessarily a huge improvement um as as terribly as I think that that just in terms of um in terms of commissioning in terms of getting those in terms of getting those jobs 
What I do think, though, is that this idea it felt like, you know, listening to um, Emma and Olivia speak about the the origins of this, of, of, you know, even daring to think to put this report together, feels a bit like the Wild Wild West. Um, I think now, uh, with the work that we're doing, um, it just feels like this would be a natural progression to look at research and statistics around other groups. So I don't, I think, you know, the, the path has been forged and we fully intend to, to keep the pipeline going um, in terms of trying to get, um, you know, good data that also helps the cause of writers from other protected characteristics. I, on the, on the women's side, I do think that it is very, people do forget and it is also quite easy for industry people in particular to feel like if there's a if someone wins an award or a particular show gets a bit of you know a bit a bit more um uh press attention and that happens to be written by a woman that all the problems are solved and whilst it is great to have those big splashy you know titles and names and things i think we do need to look at and continue to look at what is the actual experience for working writers across the board, bar the you know the few chosen few that are kind of like at the top. So, yeah, yeah no less less optimistic, I suppose, and 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 cautious that we shouldn't keep we should keep our eye on the ball. Or yeah, is that the right? Analogy? Yeah, I think vigilance is this. Just on on that platforming of of certain voices. The frustration, and, and I think some of you might remember that I did a, an interview on Women's Hour, um, and the kid, the I can't was it Jenny Colgan who interviewed me. I can't remember who interviewed me, and I was sat in a broom cupboard at Leeds at Radio Leeds, waiting to go on Women's Hour, and I heard her say, "In a minute, we're having the uh, deputy chair of the Writers Guild on, and she's going to tell tell us about their survey um, uh, about women writers." But I'm going to ask her, how can she say? The women writers aren't doing well when there's Sally Wainwright and Phoebe Waller-Bridge and all the rest of it. And I had 10 minutes to scribble down a list of 20 household name male writers. So when she asked me that, I just went, well, what about? And I went blah, 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 blah and went through the, the um, names. And thankfully, if I hadn't been in the broom cupboard with the cans on listening to that, I wouldn't have heard her said that and I was ready for her. But that is one of the, the problems that we found is that every time someone like the amazing Sally Wainwright, uh, you know, I, wa I wanted to write everything on television forever and ever, but every time she gets some success, everyone turns around and goes, see, women are doing all right. There you go. It's job done. So, um, yeah, I think that's a very good point to raise some error. Emma, particularly you work a lot in children's television. How are you feeling about your section of the industry? Well, I mean, as I said, um women uh, women writers are generally more healthily represented in children's but of course it's very it's low paid and low prestige so that those are the traditional areas where women are more to be found you know if a job if a job is less prestigious if a job is not very well paid you'll find a load of women doing it um to be really brutal um and as i said one of the things which kind of made me a bit sort of like C to my bosses was was the stat that um, that you know even within even within children's most prestigious lead writer jobs went to men um so so i think um and, and, I, and i think what was just great was just to have the statistics because nothing else can really make an impression on people and you know and as you say the people were like name a successful woman you know it's, it's like saying Oh, Obama was president for two terms. That means there's no more racism in America. You know, it's sort of just actually being able to rub people's nose at going, look, 14% on primetime drama, 28% of all TV drama. That's what we're looking at. Um, you know, don't be don't be blinded by the Michaela Coles and Sally Wayne Whites. That's that's the actual statistical reality. And um, and I think but I think you know things have changed um, in that you know as as Samara said it was the wild west of time because people just didn't have the stats and um, Diamond um, the um, the project from um, from the creative network, the creative diversity network um, that had been sort of in the offing for a very very long time and and that is a big information gathering project which does gather information on all sorts of protected characteristics and um, 
we had been put off by people telling us it was coming and then we got a bit fed up because it took a long time to materialize um and then when diamond first did come out it took a while for the information to be of, of decent quality but i think that we we do now have information a, more, a lot more information than we did back then across all sorts of groups but um rather depressingly and like can i quote the, the recent statistics or is it too early for that um sorry have i lost well my, oh, i might have lost my sound sorry um uh, you know. if i can just finish what i was saying um so we had the clip and i'll sort of setting this up but yeah um it was 28 percent of, of a tv written by women in 2017 and now it's 33.4 gone down from 38 percent in 2020 and we our understanding is that uh, covid had a big effect on that that women were the first sort of in the firing line uh when um that was happening because obviously uh the reality is that women have uh, caring responsibilities and and the burden that was part of them during covid that had a big effect so so that little incremental move on the dial is always fragile uh, which brings me to a question that two uh, people have asked about um, intersectionality and the reality of um, what's going on. Uh, Jill asks, uh, is the situation with women writers being treated as distinct from the issues of class, sexuality, etc., by the Guild, or is this being dealt with as, as one group? Samara, can I come to you on that? Because obviously it's your uh, area of expertise at the Guild. Um, we, our approach is to look at them individually, um, uh, with, with regards to the women's report, it, it purely looked at, it's hard enough getting data, full yeah. stop. Um, so yeah, we're looking at them, uh, at an, in, you know, on an individual level. Um, if things, you know, in the future, perhaps if things progress in a way which, which makes it, um, easier and more readily able for us to have a look at the intersectionality of those things, um, then we will. But as our first sort of phase, if you like, we're looking at the we're looking at what the position is for writers uh, individually. Uh, one of the things you've done in the leading, which I, I, I think is a brilliant bit of work, is you've looked at sp some of the specific issues that can uh, impact female writers. Um, in disproportionately so you're looking at um people who've had to take a, a gap for a, you know, a break from their writing career and are coming back to it and that was suggested by uh, one of our members who'd had to be a carer for a while and was coming back to her writing career and i think that's really interesting what's the the plan for that particular um group of writers well the idea really is that the the activities that the e &D committee take on and also f and then vis-a-vis -vis the guild um, is it has to be grassroots and be led by our, the writers. We are a guild, you know, of membership of whom are writers and our first job is to is to serve their concerns. So this really came from um, it came from um, members on the com committee who were talking about this idea of returning to work and after a gap for whatever reason. And it wasn't necessarily just, you know, geared towards women at all. It was just for whatever reason, life happened and you took, there was a gap in your CV, if you like. Um, and looking at the issues surrounding that, you know, the, how do you explain that gap? Um, what, what your contacts, uh, in the industry that you had before, those people may have moved on and it's all changed now. Um, issues around confidence and, um, and and just feeling like you are outside of the industry. So those, and I think those can relate to anyone, whether they were, took a, an absence because of maternity, paternity, caring issues, other, you know, other life events that might happen that may impact a writer's ability to continue working so um that's where it was born from and it's open for, any, for to anyone who has or is experiencing a, a break from work or contemplating one um and i think the idea behind it is to start as a network for them to discuss the issues at hand and if there is a a, a kind of a strong passion or reoccurring theme or some kind of support that they feel 
is needed to help those writers in that situation, then the idea is then to to is to pitch um, <laughs> to the committee about what they would like to see in the world that might help them, and and then we take up that baton and we charge ahead. That's and but that's the same for every you know every individual group. I think uh, one of the things that we're perhaps a little bit bad as communicate bad at communicating as a guild is, is what can we actually do? And I'm gonna I'm gonna put Emma on the spot. Um, when someone comes to us with an issue, so, so we, I think our casework breaks into sort of two things, which is someone who's been as an individual badly treated. Uh, we kick a few dolls down with, if uh, with their permission, and we we advocate for individual members when we can. But when we um, identify a bigger problem that's affecting a lot of rights, for example. Um, attendance, people not being paid attendance fees, the changing industry um, when it comes to writers' rooms, etc., like that, things like that. What is it that we can do? What's the action that we take, Emma, just for, for anybody who sometimes thinks, well, I've, I've got this problem, but there's not, what's the point of ringing the guild? Well, we, we, we can and we do um, have meetings with companies, you know, such as the BBC, ITV, Channel 4. And we will talk about global problems and uh, and, it, and it's interesting that you know quite often the problems we raise you know they will be shocked shocked at these things happen you know such as you know people not being paid for attendance or people being um not you know and, and so we say so, so we, well, we might say to the bbc um independent producers are making shows for you and not paying writers properly and and they'll say um well of course they are and they'll say well no these producers aren't or whatever and, and uh, and I mean, it's it's interesting. People will, and it's and I suppose this 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 is sort of quite important when it comes to things like equality. People will very very seldom hold their hands up and say, "Actually, we got it wrong. We weren't good enough." But the human fear of being told off or called out in public is so great that even though they will deny furiously that there ever was a problem, they might quietly work to make sure that there isn't a problem in future and to fix that problem. So, you know, as we can and do hold meetings with people and, you know, even though we, you know, <laughs> we don't necessarily get a huge mayor culpa and an apology, a public apology to the afflicted party, it does often change things. And, you know, and of course, and on, on an individual basis, of course, we can often, you know, get things put right for that, for that one particular writer. I think information and empowerment, I'm, I'm working with a, a writer at the moment who wasn't aware of rebrief fees. Um, and I think that's that's probably our next step is to make sure that every writer walks into every meeting armed with their rights like shields. So they know what's what they're entitled to and they're not embarrassed about asking for it. Particularly when I talked, I talked to a lot of um, higher education groups, creative writing, English, all of that kind of film studies, what have you in my region? So I'm, I'm setting leads at the moment. Uh, some of you all know. Um, and I always open it up to questions at the end. I tell my little, do my little spiel, tell them they can join the guild, and then I open it up to questions. And invariably, the question that doesn't get asked is, how do I get paid, and can I make a living uh, from being a writer? And I always tell them off for not asking that because it has to start early has to start knowing your worth, knowing what you're entitled to, knowing what your rights are. And I think that's one of the big jobs um, of the Guild. Olivia, do you think writers are feeling more, particularly female writers, are feeling more empowered now after what we kicked off with this report? Uh, I think yes and no, because I think being a writer is mostly a life of rejection. Um, <laughs> And uh, so actually having those statistics as kind of benchmark and go, OK, this is not just my paranoia. This is not just me thinking that they're against me. They really are against me <laughs> um, is strangely comforting, but uh, it doesn't doesn't really solve the problem in itself. I think it, what it does is is weaponize us to to be as you say, to, you know, go, where's the money? And are you paying me for this? And to be a bit bolder about asking those questions. And, um, but I think it's, I think it remains shockingly um, difficult, honestly. Um, looking at, I was just looking at the report that I put up um, a link to, 
And one of its findings was that people who called out uh, sexist behavior or harassment were much more likely to be fired if they came from a minority background of one sort or another um, than people who didn't and also called out bad behavior. Um, so I wouldn't say that, you know, everything is great and everybody owns up to everything now. I'm afraid that's just not the case. I think, as Emma said, lots of people know they ought to behave better, but until they get called out on it, I'm not sure that they do. Um, I look at the, the BFI statistics, which look really good. Unfortunately, the BFI is only a very small part of the film industry. And also, almost all those female writers that they they um, hire are actually writer directors. Um, and they're, you know, they really don't champion writers very much. And at the Guild, we we had recently had a conversation with the film committee and and the BFI um and uh and challenged them on this um and i think it's you just have to keep on reporting things to the guild um because it's much easier for the guild to take up the cudgels on behalf of a group than for an individual i do think it's you know it's problematic for individuals to call this out still uh and that's what the guild is really good at doing at representing us all rather than being the one individual who says I don't think this is right and you should do something about it. That's really still very difficult. That's brilliant. Thank you, Olivia. Um, just to remind you, if any questions, because um, we're, we're moving into the last 10 minutes or so, any questions, do pop them in the chat. Um, let's think about the future now. Moving on, um, we know that it's not a perfect world. We didn't solve sexism with our report in 2018. You'll be shocked to hear. Uh, it's still out there. Um, what what work is left for the guild to do? I'll start with Emma. Uh, and what do you think we need to do moving forward? Well, it's interesting because I think this this whole sort of conversation has galvanised me in looking at the stats. Um, I think you know it was it was something exhausting, and it and you know, and I, I'm not going to lie, it is quite exhausting, like constantly challenging powerful people to be told you're and to be often told you're sort of somehow delusional. Or I was warned by several people that I was potentially damaging my own career and um, and I think um, you know I, I'm, I'm just to think off the top of my head I, th I, th I think we, we um, sh should perhaps you know put out a press release saying you know five years on have things changed and, and perhaps um, um, look to re perhaps revitalize this campaign but also I think looking to the future um, we are um, planning to do more pieces of work um, looking at, at other um, types of, of, of um, of diversity and um, uh, you know and obviously one of those has been, has been has been held up for reasons beyond our control but we do want we want to do that and I think I suppose the important thing to remember I think when it comes to all kinds of diversity is it often does come down to money because um, the fact that you know most writers can't afford to keep working for free and um, if people aren't if people aren't properly treated and properly trained um, only the sorts of people who can afford to do it for a hobby will remain, and that that group of people will, you know, be not particularly diverse, in, certainly in terms of, you know, class. So, yeah. Thanks, Emma. Um, Samara, I mean, you're in the hot seat um, as co-chair of the <laughs> ED. What work have you got planned? What work would you Because there's also a, a capacity issue as well. There's only so much we can do at any one time without, um, we're all working writers. Um, what's the reality? What can we do sort of now? Do you think we should have another look five years on at, at where we are now and maybe name and shame some people who haven't fulfilled their promises? Um, I think there's possibly two things that we could do. How, how you know, how likely that we can galvanize people and money in order to do them but I think they're two pieces of work that that would be beneficial the first is um is to look at um when the report came out promises were made about the allocation of resources and the um and 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 commissioners or channels looking at um making bold statements about what they plan to do um in the future uh, with regards to women, I think we could rather do that work ourselves um, 
we should at least ask them to to self audit themselves because um if they're not already doing that then that's that poses a problem um because from the get-go they allowed it to get down to 16 18 percent uh without self-regulating and so i think we should encourage them to self-regulate um and there might be a um the the response might be that diamond does that but i think that there is a um there is a lag between when that data is collected analyzed and reported and perhaps they should be doing stuff that's particularly when it comes to promises that were made they should be self uh yeah self-regulating themselves to make sure that they've achieved them um the second thing i think it would be an absolute shame not to do some kind of follow-up post the women's report um what that looks like whether it's as in-depth as the original report was i don't know whether we have the funds to be able to do it i don't know whether the cdn's um you know, uh, diamond figures helps plug that gap uh, to be able to offer us alternative data that we can report on. I I don't know. I don't know because, um, well, money, it's always really hard to know about that. But with regards to diamond, it's kind of out of our hands and we still don't have necessarily the ability to go wide with the data that we do have. So, um, there are issues and problems around those because we don't want to just have the data. We want to shout about it. We want to, you know, make it available. We want people to, to be held accountable. So um, there's a kind of balancing off money versus the ability to shout about those things. And as I said already, uh, equality rights is the beginning of a decades-long campaign for the Writers Guild. Um, and we are looking at doing similar types of research and reporting on the um, successes and or failure of this industry to commission writers from other protected characteristics. The first one that we uh, looked at uh, was our writers of colour. And I say it's the first one. And you can see we're kind of like, I don't know, three, four years on. Um, and we still haven't been able to be in a position to publish anything. Um, like um, we alluded to earlier, that's not because of a lack of willpower or even a lack of funds. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we got the money together. Um, unfortunately, the company that we tasked with doing the research went into administration uh, partway through. So we are literally navigating how best to salvage what we can from it and where to go from there. Um, conversations are happening with regards to an event of some kind or um, how we can plug the gap in terms of the data. But um, yeah, it's it's an ongoing battle. I'm going to be honest with you, when I got involved with the Guild, I never thought I'd be so excited by st statistical analysis <laughs> and data I, I now loved it I mean I was terror I was the sort of person Rishi Zunak was talking about the other week I was sh just awful at maths and now I love a pie chart I love all of that kind of thing I love a percentage I think it's fantastic so yeah we are fine Joe one of the things I'd say as a follow-up to that Samara is um if you are interested in getting more involved with the Guild, please do uh, get in touch with that. There are craft committees if you are a TV writer, a theatre writer, a comedy writer, um, a book writer, uh, video games, that's the one I always forget. Uh, theatre, I've said theatre. Um, if you uh, work across the crafts, uh, get involved. There's the EMB committee, um, there's the regional uh, reps as well. There are loads of opportunities to get involved. But one of the things... Um, I've learned from, uh, I think, over 10 years of activism with the Guild, is whatever time you think it will take to do something, to get something changed, triple it. It always takes longer. There's, a, there's such um, a frustration, which is why everybody who's been long-term involved with the Guild has that slightly uh, haggard look, but the determination to get over there, and I think that was one of the best things about the Women's Report, was we got one over the line, we got the stats, and it had such a massive 
um, effect uh, for us. Olivia, is there anything you want to say? We've come to the last couple of minutes. Anything you'd like to say about the future and what where our efforts should be in? Well, just picking just picking up on what you said, Lisa, and Tom Williams' question about what it what we learn from this for future campaigns and different areas. I think one of the things that was was really encouraging regardless of what the kind of the long-term action has been was the impact that that report had it was really um it really made a big noise at the time um and having those numbers you know it's not just you who loves a pie chart but basically journalists love to have some numbers um so i think in terms of learning for for future campaigns it was a very effective piece of campaigning uh it really got the issue um, into people's intrays in a big way. Uh, and it was very specific. And I think that's, you know, that's what I would say sort of going forward, it was really, it would be great to follow up on this, but also to take as far as possible that same kind of approach of going, let's be as specific as possible about what we think is wrong and what we think needs fixing. Um, whenever we can, you know, in our campaigning. So, and that really relies on on all of us members to speak up and come forward and say, I think this is a problem. You know, do we have any research on this? Do we know what's going on? Because with all the will in the world, the, the officers and the uh, EC can't cover everything. They need to be kept informed about what's happening out there. I think that's true, Olivia. Thank you very much. Um, I want to say a, a massive uh, thank you to our panel. I think that's been uh, fairly wide ranging. Um, I want to thank everybody um, who's come along uh, to the meeting um, and given their time. Um, if there's anything else you'd like to know about this, please do get in touch um, with me. My uh, direct email address is on the Writers Guild uh, website. Uh, but I will say thank you very much for your time and thanks uh, for joining us today.